if we are in an environment where interest rates have likely peaked and it's unlikely that they're going to come down sharply and they may do who knows none of us knows anything for certain about what happens to the economics but it's quite likely that they'll come down slowly and they'll probably take their time the central bankers in bringing interest rates down if they do it's quite a good environment for a fixed income and fixed income ets probably should do well in that environment um because what that suggests is, is that, you know, the big sell-off that's happened in things like government securities, ETFs, is probably overdone. And maybe it might be worth looking at them again, particularly if you can get yields of above 4%. Now, that doesn't necessarily cross over into other forms of bonds, and particularly bond ETFs that do invest in corporate bonds. Because, of course, one of the reasons why interest rates are probably coming down is, is because central bankers are worried that we're entering a recession. And if we're entering a recession, that usually means that um, the defaults on corporate bonds go up, and they already are. Um, defaults on consumer loans go up, they already are in America. Um, the default rate on car loans has gone up quite substantially and is near a kind of near-term peak. That's probably not great for corporate bonds. But at some point, though, actually generally the fixed income side of the spectrum begins to look quite attractive. So if we're at that turning point, and we don't know for certain we are, and we, we I would guess, I don't know, finger in the air we're probably close to or at that point in the US maybe maybe not in the UK who knows and we've also seen in, in, uh, kind of numbers coming out suggesting inflation rates are coming down as well though they may go up again um, particularly as we've got quite high wage inflation and that could feed through um, then that's probably conducive for what we call kind of risk on more risky assets generally From an industry point of view, I suppose you hear a lot of active fund managers say that in a more volatile era where inflation rates are bobbing up and down but are certainly above 3 or 4% and interest rates are bobbing up and down and maybe coming down for the time being, but who knows, maybe go up again in the future, that, that helps active fund managers. The problem with that argument is, is there's not a lot of data to suggest that that's true. Yeah. Um, a variety of researchers from, you know, big index researchers all the way through to asset allocation experts have looked at more volatile markets where the macroeconomic data is more volatile. And then they've sort of said, does that really help active fund managers? And the short answer is no, not really. I think that we're likely to see continued ETF penetration in Europe for one very simple reason, which is more and more investors are beginning to look at costs. And I think the one thing that's dropped through from the whole uh, St. James's Place um, run in, I suppose you say, with the regulators, where they've effectively taken a closer look at the cost structure, particularly the exit, exit fee structure, is that I, whenever I talk to individual investors, a lot of them now are saying, well, I, I, you know, I, I heard about that St. James's Place stuff, and, and I'm looking at my fees, and fees are, I think, coming under the spotlight. And they're probably coming to the spotlight because actually in these volatile markets where active fund managers probably haven't been outperforming, actually having high fees on your underlying investments really does make a really does make a difference. And that naturally provides a tailwind for ETFs. And I also think there's a generational thing going on as well. I do think that as you know the twenty somethings turn into thirty somethings, thirty somethings turn into forty somethings, they've let they've grown up, I think, in a less kind of uh, less a culture where there's less adulation of the active fund manager I and mean, when I was you know sort of starting to accumulate some money and be able to invest properly we still lived in the age of the active fund manager lots of famous names and I think that's probably less true than it was before so there's a as the younger generation begin to accumulate more capital they begin to focus less on the top performing fund managers and begin to focus more on what do I do for asset allocation? And that favours ETFs enormously. So I think there's still a tailwind behind ETFs in Europe. Well, I do think it, when we look at innovation in the ETF sector, I think I would look at two or three things. First of all, I'd say I think we might finally see the emergence of more active ETFs in Europe. I think the time is right. Um, I think very simply because if there's just a, a greater pool of people who are predominant ETF investors, that's just a larger pool of people you can talk to about ET active ETFs. It's, you know, you know, there's more fish in the pond, you know, so you can go fish with new strategies. So I, I think that helps active ETFs. I think, as I've mentioned, alternative strategies, I think is probably an interesting area. And I think that uh, we're going to likely see, and we've already seen, it's nothing new, 
um, more granular strategies, which in reality look a bit like active. So, for instance, um, you know, we've seen news that there's a kind of Indian tech ETF coming. You know, and, and I think that, that that's kind of a harbinger of the future where you can get more finely targeted, more niche ETF strategies where an investor can make a kind of small allocation to a very focused area. And I think we'll see more of that. And where I suggest we should see more of it is in fixed income. Um, I think there's much more room to do interesting stuff in fixed income. I, I suspect for consideration for investors is that, um, look, if you're a long-term investor and you've got a 30-year time horizon, forget all this worrying about what happens in the next year and a half for the markets. Just stick with a, you know, you've got, you've got a risk tolerance. That means you can just stick with equities through thick and thin. Make sure you're diversified. Um, but the one thing I would suggest is the US. Most equity strategies have a very high focus on the US. And that's because the US has done very well. It's because American, big American corporates have got phenomenal pricing power, particularly tech companies, but not only. Um, and, you know, if you look at something like the MSCI world, which is a very diversified global developed world market index, I think it, last time I looked, it was about 70% US equities. And quite often those US equities are very concentrated in the top seven, magnificent seven or top 10 or top 15 stocks. And I do think that emphasis on that word diversification is becoming ever more acute. You know, it's great. Those, the big tech names have done terribly well and I wouldn't want to bet against them. You know, I suspect they'll probably do quite well. But if you really care about diversification, you should be thinking long and hard about how you have exposure to other thematics, other strategies, other styles, other factors, um, other kind of risk factors, other cap sizes. Because I think it's... You know that we've had an amazing runabout performance by US large cap equities and logic suggests just simply mean reversion. At some point they will underperform and then something else, I mean Japanese equities have been doing quite well, um, something else will outperform. So that just places that emphasis on diversification.